How many of you are founders and startup builders? Raise your hand. OK, that's a lot. So imagine the outcome that you want for your company. What does that look like? Is it a big acquisition? Is it an initial public offering? Well, for those of you that want an acquisition, don't even think about getting acquired. Today, we'll dive into why that's so important. And along the way, I'll share my lessons about my playbook and how I built a successful startup. So first, my name is Terry, and I'm an ex-founder. Uh, previously, I worked at Asana, I worked at Microsoft, and I committed five years of my life to starting a company. So during the five years, I lived and breathed the startup. I had no hobbies, I had no social life. Literally night and day, I was at my computer, and it was probably one of the most painful experiences I've ever had. So as founders, why do we subject ourselves to this pain? And it all comes down to this. We had a mission that I believed in that was really core to my personal experience. And it really got me through the multiplicity of hardships. So what was my mission? Growing up, my parents immigrated from Taiwan to Arizona. They were dirt poor. And they rented out this low income unit in this apartment complex. And it was the cheapest unit where there was right next to a trash can. And I kid you not, my toys, our bedding, our furniture was all from this trash can. And my parents really sought to survive. So they, con they collected recycled trash cans. My mom went door to door, knocking on our neighbors, trying to get babysitting and house and haircut gigs. And my dad got a job at the local cafeteria. So with persistence, they reached an inflection point, And that was when they found their community. That community was called the Taiwanese American Association, in which they helped get, make them fulfilled, helped get them connections to jobs. And so years later, my dad got a job at Intel as an engineer. And then my mom became a real estate agent, and she became the president of this local community. Whoop. So, Bible was a way for communities to accomplish their goals together, and it was monetizable by creators. We raised two and a half million from all-star angels and VCs. So it included people like the YouTube co-founder, Steve Chen, the Lean Startup co-founder, um, Eric Ries, Kissmetrics founder, Hayton Shaw, the meetup.com founder, Scott Heiferman, and many more. And in an early 2022, we were acquired by the $6 billion company, Kajabi. And it's a way for creators to earn revenue through starting a digital business. So that includes coaching, memberships, community, and courses. Once I joined, I became the head of product. Uh, like the moderator said, we, I became the blogger innovator of the year, and I now write for the Forbes Business Council. And it was an absolutely life-changing experience. So I can tell you personally, <laughs> The biggest outcomes come when you're not looking. You want to focus on building a sell-worthy business, not a sellable business. And here's why. When you build a delightful product customers actually depend on, you have strong fundamentals, high growth, your exit will come, IPO or acquisition. And if you decide to take investments, don't even mention the word acquisition. At the end of the day, investors don't want to play small, right? You have 10 companies you invest in, seven of them are going to go belly up, two of them will have inconsequential gains, and one of them will actually succeed and return the fund of the portfolio. So let's run through how to build a valuable, sell-worthy business. So I love this video because it shows you how crazy can turn into genius, 
How many of you have seen this video? Okay, cool. Hopefully more of you will find it inspiring. If it plays, there we go. So this was at the Sasquatch Music Festival in Georgia. And when it starts out, it is a it's kind of a nut job looking guy dancing, right? I think if I had been standing there at this festival, I would have thought, okay, that's kind of cool. But he has one of his first followers join in here and he starts dancing with him. And so at this point, you're probably still thinking that a few of them are just having a good time, probably on something, but having a good time nonetheless. And more and more people will start joining. And so this eventually becomes what a startup is like. It is a vehicle of believers. And so for this one, he's got three believers. So the first one, the second one, they could be your early co-founders. They could be your early teammates, your first investor, your first customer. And he's still dancing. And there's another person who joins. And there's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven. This continually grows. And so when you're starting a company, you not only start recruiting people to your mission, to the problem you're solving, but more and more customers join in, more investors join in, and it starts ballooning. And it becomes this massive movement that you've created. And eventually, you have a massive unicorn of a business where all your customers believe in you, all your investors believe in you, and everyone looks back and says, I knew from the very beginning. So the full, full clip is uh, you can find on YouTube, but it's just basically continues to stretch out and become more and more people dancing. So even when you do things 100% right, you will hit this trajectory. And I know the last speaker touched on this as well, but this is directly from YC. There's an exciting moment where you think that you've made it, and then there's many, many, many low points. In fact, you'll notice that most of the journey is low and not high. And that's something as a founder, you get used to. You have to go through it, you have to have grit, you have to overcome it, and that's, you don't have a business without it. So our company, Viably, had multiple troughs. And when I tell you there were a lot of troughs, I really mean it. It was really difficult. We had co-founder changes. We had product fires. We had key employees leave. And so here's one of the stories that I'm gonna share with you today about our biggest trough to hopefully get you through your own challenge. So at the beginning, the company was focused on helping communities develop fulfilling experiences through our wedge of meetups. So you'll see that there was a map and there was a way for people to segment into their locations and eventually have an in real life meetup. So we had 550 meetups in 150 countries and it was working. There was, our servers were overloaded with engagement and I thought, wow, we found a product market fit, you guys. And it all came crashing down with one catastrophic event. And that was COVID in 2021. So it went to zero in the span of a week. And I thought, this is probably the end. What are we gonna do? So our team got together and we started brainstorming. How can we create the same mission with the assets we have, which is the online ability for us to connect? And so we brainstormed and came up with this. After much experimentation, our meetups were transferred to be online. And so you can see these are specific communities that all met up with each other. And we introduced this concept of challenges where people would do activities together in person during, or online during the pandemic. And then we expanded into more traditional Facebook group-like tools, like discussions. So this was our trajectory once we pivoted. And so you can see we were really making our creators happy because they were making money charging for their communities. 
and we are on track to hit six million in ARR, in total membership volume for our communities. And so we are averaging 57% month over month growth, which is phenomenal. We were very happy. Then we got our Series A term sheet. So this is what an example term sheet looks like from a, a venture capital fund. Um, and so this is an offer from a fund essentially to say, hey, we'll put in this amount of money for this amount of return. Um, and we simultaneously got inbound interest from other companies. So we had corp dev teams reach out to us from Google, from Patreon. And the thing with when you focus on traction is that word travels. So we had multiple companies reach out to us. You know, a lot of venture and corp dev teams, they have tools and insights to be able to track and see which companies are actually doing well. Um, like buying credit card data, for example. And you can even intentionally, as a founder, plant that word of mouth by building in public, having notable advisors and investors who can like whisper into the wind. So then, I started to think about the risk versus reward. So I wanted to make the best strategic decision possible for our company. And unlike a lot of founders I spoke to, I actually shopped around. So this is really unique. I don't think a lot of founders do this, and I highly recommend it because it gave us a lot of leverage and options. So let's say that you are going to get acquired. What should you do? So we have four M&A criteria to think about. So the first is your product market fit conviction. So this means how much product market fit do you have, really? And this requires some self-awareness, some emotional intelligence to be able to look at your business, look at yourself, and analyze whether or not you've really hit it. And believe me, if you're questioning whether or not you have product market fit, you probably don't have it, right? When people describe the feeling of product market fit, it feels like things are flying off the shelves. Things are growing. You don't need to really push the boulder uphill. I knew that when we stopped pushing that boulder, that it would roll back, even though we were exponentially growing. The second is your own founder energy. And this is something that after five years, I was extremely burnt out. If you're a founder, the entire company relies on your energy, your creativity, your mind space, and you really hold the burden of the entire company. So you have to make sure whenever you execute that you are preserving your own energy as a founder, and it probably don't want to do what I did where I had no life. Third is market timing. So what valuations are you seeing in the macro environment? So this one is an element of luck. So today in the 2023 market, we would have had a very different offer than in early 2022. And you can best believe in 2021, it would have been even better because it was a frothy market in time. So that's an element you wanna consider. And then the last is financial return. This one's obvious, but you have multiple shareholders. You have your investors, you have your co-founders, you have your own family, you have your own angel investors. And so that is something that you have to analyze. And when there's a conflict of interest, you should always prioritize the ones that gave up the most. So what kind of valuations can you expect? So there are three parts to every valuation. There's team, product, and traction. So with a team, the company wants to acquire a top tier talent and team. So they're going, one that's going to change the trajectory of the business in its entirety. So when you're in talks, you want to make sure that they believe and they can see why your team is the best in the business. So any accolades, any pedigree, any information about what they've accomplished, that all needs to go in the conversation. The second is product. So the experience you built, whether that's an app or a store, when we were acquired, Vibly became integrated into Kajabi communities. So it became part of that deal, which increases the valuation. And then third, it's traction. So this is the heaviest weight of all. So the logos you saw earlier of Figma, of Whole Foods, of WhatsApp, 
those outlier retur size returns came only because they had such unspeakable traction that there was an existential threat to the companies that if they didn't buy it, they would be in a hole. Broadly, the more you stack, the higher your valuation. So these are example multiples, uh, just as baselines for you to compare. So you'll see in SaaS, it could be six to 10x, consumer tech, four to eight x. However, the thing to consider is when you're in tech and you saw those big deals that happen in the billions, those were at a 50 to 75 times multiple in some cases. So it all, doesn't all follow these rules. So one principle when you decide to sell is you want to remember that M&A is not fundraising. It is really important to remember because during fundraising, you're taught a lot of different mechanics and I won't go through all those today, but you want to make sure that you come off with someone likable and someone collaborative, which is very different than in fundraising where it's a little bit of a game with investors. If there's any investors in the audience, I'm sorry to say, but they tend to subconsciously reward people who are a bit like Adam Newman or Travis Calacanis or um, Elon Musk, who are so sure of themselves that they can come off sometimes as a little bit of an a-hole. And so you have to differentiate yourself during the M&A process. These are people who you're going to be working with for the foreseeable future. So they need to see your ability and see that they like you. Next is to sell the vision. So what would it look like if your two companies joined forces? So you want to help your acquirer imagine the future. So think about what are their goals? What do they want to accomplish? and then pitch them on that. So I had a you know, 20 point deck with each of these companies. I pitched over 15 of these companies. And for each, I had a vision of how the two would work in synergist and energy and how Vibly would bring their company to another level. With Kajabi, it was obvious because they needed community to stay relevant. And I pitched them on what would happen to the revenue, to the business, if they came together. Okay. <laughs> Does this work? Okay, great. Next, we have get leverage. And this is really important because leverage increases price and it increases urgency. If you ever sold something before, like a house or a car, or you got a job, all the leverage will, like, will do for you is increase your ability to get better options. And every price process you run should be a funnel. So you can see here, uh, everything we did, whether reaching out to press, whether getting customers and influencers, whether having a, an investor like round, fundraising round, or even with M&A, we had a whole lot of people who are our prospects tracked and we ran through it like a funnel. And ultimately we got five acquisition offers. So this is a step-by-step -step process of what the M&A can, can look like. And it could be a lot longer, but I think this is the minimum of what you would see. So you could see introduction, there's a first conversation, there's a team meeting, there's another meeting, there's a meeting after that, there's initial diligence, there's a letter of intent that comes, there's also team interviews, purchase agreement, negotiation, diligence, and then closing. So that's 12 different steps. So the number one mistake that founders make is that they don't, they don't go through this funnel and they don't think about maximizing the amount of options that pass through. So what is the likelihood that one of your options will actually make it through? And one is the option, what is the possibility of price when that happens if you only have one option? Spoiler, it's not that great. And so one of my favorite founder friends, she got an M&A deal and she had one and thought that she only needed one to go through just because of the certainty of what the deal was seeming like. 
but without all the other options on the table, it stalled because there was no reason for the company to act now. And so that's really the power of leverage is it gets you from point A to point B and you can use that to close it up. Something will work here. There we go. All right, the next thing is you wanna make sure to manage the process. So as a person running the process, you do not wanna leave things up to chance. Make sure every action item is tracked. Make sure there's a clear owner for each one and make sure there's due dates assigned. And what you want to do is in all your communications, continually remind your prospect of what those action items are and lead them to the close. So you're responsible for this. And if you and this is an example here that you can see um, I used on one of our acquires. So next, you want to negotiate the deal terms. There's so many different dimensions in a deal, and I won't bore you with all of them, but these are the ones that I found the most critical. So there's cash versus stock, and that is what are you going to get in cash versus what are you going to get in the acquirer's stock? Obviously, there's cases where stock is better, but generally, I recommend cash because it's liquid um, and it's more certain. The second is upfront versus earned payout. So upfront payout means you're going to get it right away versus earned over a period of time. Um, obviously, the better is upfront in this case because you get it in hand now. Then there's time period to earn out. So this can range from zero to four years. The less time that you have to earn out, the better. So a lot of founders really push on this. And then if you're joining the company, your salary, your bonus, your equity all matters. So you'll want to negotiate that too. But then there's your team. And your team's compensation is uh, depending on you as well. And so as a leader of the company, you should be thinking about the people who trusted you in the first place and who sacrificed a lot of their lives to get here. And then the last is contract terms like indemnification and termination, which essentially means what happens when the company fires you. And who takes responsibility if there's a lawsuit that emerges? So there's some commonly asked questions that I'm gonna go through. The first being, when do you tell your team? So there are two variables to consider. The first is team adaptability. So how comfortable is your team with change and unknowns? Our team was very comfortable with dramatic fluctuations in the business. We had been through hell and back. And so I told them probably earlier than most people would. The second consideration is directional confidence. You never know when an M&A deal will fall through. So I sh still shared with our team about two months before the interview process so that they could have time to prepare. But it wasn't right away when I had the discussions either. Another commonly asked question I get is, how do you know if you're making the right decision? And this one is hard, you guys, because there is no right decision. Oftentimes, it's all about making the best decision you can with the input you have at that moment in time that leads to the desired outcomes that you want. So in the end, if you keep making these uh, best decisions, you end up with this at scale, the most the most right decisions as possible. So what is life post exit? This is another common question I get. Um, today I continue to run the product. Our entire team came on board, so six full time and then 20 contractors. Um, I travel a lot, I bought a house, but what makes me the happiest is when I see others inspired by the work that I've done. But there is a dark side to this, and not everyone realizes this, but it almost feels like you've lost a baby. You've spent five years working on it, you have now given it to someone else, and you've now lost yourself. And so many founders can feel aimless, depressed, suicidal post-exit. 
Mike Krieger, the co-founder of Instagram, experienced anxiety and depression after selling his company to Facebook in 2012. Matt Levkin, who was a um, co-founder of PayPal, acquired by eBay, also experienced this and since had treatment and recovered. And then there are people like James Dyson, who sold the company in 2017 for 11.9 billion pounds. And afterwards, he struggled with depression and also needed treatment. So I'll share with you my experience that I rarely tell people. For about one month, for four weeks, I woke up every day crying because I didn't know why. I felt like I had some kind of cloud over me and I didn't know exactly what the reasons were, but it felt like I was really depressed. And so sometimes in that state, you wonder what the point of life is. So this goes to show that happiness is a state of not possession, but a state of gratitude. So for all the founders in the trenches building, you guys are heroes. And your startup is a wondrous journey, full of exciting possibilities, full of challenges ahead of you. And you can conquer so many of them, and each one will be more fulfilling than the last. And then the bottom line is you'll never find anything more rewarding and more impactful in your life. So thank you for spending the final talk at Slush 2023 with me. If you found this helpful, feel free to connect with me. Or if you want to start a digital business, you can start one at Kajabi. And with that, I could not be more excited for you to go forward and catch them all.